we get started. Um, we're going to start today. The, the theme of the conversation is really focused on paratransit and human service transportation. Um, we are going to start today by hearing from RTD and then a member of our committee, Kristen Trussman and Dr. Cog. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to um, Paul with RTD, Paul Hamilt Hamilton with RTD, which I believe has a presentation to share with us. So take it away, Paul. Yeah, and uh, I'm going to wait. Oh, very good. Looks like you can see my screen. That was almost seamless. <laughs> As I was telling uh, Matthew earlier, I have never actually tried to do this from this particular computer. And as we all know, we're all learning to be techies, whether we wanted to or not uh, during COVID. Uh, yes, again, my name is Paul Hamilton, and I'm a senior manager of paratransit services uh, at RTD. Uh, I'm uh, here to tell you a little bit about uh, the paratransit services, broadly speaking, why paratransit services even exist, what they are, uh, how RTD provides that service, not only the basic paratransit service, but uh, some of the extensions that have cropped up that are in addition to basic transportation service requirements from the federal government. Uh, and then uh, I'll leave it up to you as to whether or not you want to take questions right after that, or if we want to wait until all the presentations are finished, I can do it either way. Yeah, so we'll take questions through um, after your presentation. So folks, uh, members of the committee, you all please feel free to use the chat and we will um, we will circle back around on those as well. Perfect. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, for those of you who may know already, uh, ADA has origins that go all the way back to the extension of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, uh, specifically when they started to address transportation. It was Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, which uh, came about in 1973. Uh, as we know, nothing in Washington happens fast, and neither did this. So while the legislation was written in 73, it wasn't actually ratified until after a first protest took place in 1977 in San Francisco. Uh, and then, obviously, we all know here in Denver, that one of the more well-known ones across the nation that had to do with public transit took place in 1977. A lot of that had to do with where we were in those days. Uh, that is to say, we didn't even have uh, uh, accessible buses on fixed route uh, or rail. Uh, and uh, a protest took place uh, after uh, uh, RTD had not yet made more than 12 of their buses accessible. And uh, what you see here is the uh, protest that took place on out, out on Colfax Avenue uh, by the Gang of 19, uh, which was a, a group uh, put together by Atlantis, uh, which is still around to this day, uh, the group that is. And uh, what it ended up spawning was the beginning of what we now know as an entirely accessible system, an accessible fleet in fixed route and rail, uh, and takes us to the next point, which was going the next step. That is, in, uh, in 1990, the ADA law, further refined what we already had seen come about during the uh, Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and put together five specific areas uh, or address five specific areas of accessibility. And we are the number two or title two of that legislation, which is public entities and uh, uh, public entities and public transportation. Obviously, we're also uh, uh, have elements of title three, uh, public accommodations the built infrastructure that leads up to some of our accommodations. Uh, Title V, you don't see it mentioned here because that's a miscellaneous provision that's put in there in case they decide there's other entity, uh, other elements that they need to address at a later date. Uh, specifically, further refining what ADA meant for us and some of the guiding legislation that came out of the DOT in 1991 was uh, uh, parts, my, 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 my mistake, I got it carried away with my button. Parts 37 and 38 of uh, CFR 49, uh, CFR standing for the Code of Federal Regulations, uh, and those are the essentially meat and potatoes of what guides us in providing uh, accessible transportation and what we now know as our paratransit element. Paratransit, uh, it was decided as part of that ADA legislation needed to be provided in addition to fixed route for anyone who was not able to ride the fixed route system for all or some of their trips. 
specifically, it was decided or determined by, uh, at the federal level that uh, the minimum standard for that would be three quarters of a mile uh, from any fixed route system that is a not, not a commuter route and three quarters of a mile boundary around any rail station. Uh, and this area that you see here comprises our entire RTD service area, that's 2,300 square miles. Uh, and then the light blue color that you see represents the area of that three quarter mile boundary, which is nearly half of that entire service area that we serve. Uh, when is paratransit uh, required? Well, uh, there are specific elements when we uh, uh, basically provide paratransit and I'm not gonna read them to you verbatim. Obviously the one that's grayed out is uh, when a fixed route accessible vehicle is not available. That one doesn't apply here. All the other ones do. Uh, that is when people can't navigate the system, uh, when they can't get to a uh, bus stop, regardless uh, as a result of their disability. And uh, well, I'm just getting carried away with my button. I'm going to go right to the next slide. Finally, the last element of paratransit service, complementary paratransit services, defining what the standard is. Uh, in 1993, the FTA provided a little more guidance in terms of what it meant to provide paratransit, and how we knew when we were providing what was required of us to uh, successfully provide paratransit. And those are the six primary criteria that we use not only to build our system, but monitor our system. And they are uh, service area, as I had said before, it needs to be three quarters of a mile for, from uh, a fixed route corridor. Uh, response time needs to be similar to the fixed route infrastructure. Fares, in terms of fares, we cannot be more than double the fixed route fare equivalent. So, for instance, uh, uh, we could charge as much as $6. We all know that that's not the case right now because our base fare is $3 for fixed route. We actually charge $5 as our fare right now. Uh, there are no trip purpose restrictions. Some of the early days, some systems were uh, determining that medical took priority over some other trip types that is not the case uh hours and days of service must be equivalent to or similar as a minimum must be equivalent to our fixed route infrastructure and finally there cannot be any capacity constraints on our system that is uh, regardless of how many people call us at any hour of the day in times that we're supposed to be providing service that's equivalent to fixed route we must provide that service this gives you a basic overview of what our fleet component is for our paratransit system right now. We operate approximately 340 dedicated buses and use three service providers to do that, MV, VIA, and TransDev. And then we also have TransDev providing a non-dedicated fleet that is comprised of uh, taxis that they operate and then subcontract additional taxi and NEMT or non-emergency medical transportation providers. Uh, getting a little bit in now to uh, some of the things that we provide that are above and beyond the basic paratransit service. Uh, we have provided excessive cab service, which is contracted service that our, any of our customers can opt into. And we've been doing that since 2005. Uh, it offers a same day alternative. It's less expensive than the uh, paratransit fare. It's only $2 per, uh, per trip. Uh, and then we subsidize the next $12, meaning that trips that tend to uh, be three to four miles, and our average is about three miles, can be fully covered on a taxi fare by the total $14 of the $2 uh, portion that the customer would pay and the $12 portion that uh, we would subsidize. Uh, since uh, in uh, 2019, and obviously any statistics that most of us are using right now, we're trying to go back to 2019 simply because they're not particularly realistic statistics or, or trending statistics when we use 2020. But in 2019, we provided approximately 38% of uh, our rate, I'm sorry, 38% of our regular accessoride users were taking at least some of their trips on excessive cab. One of the more recent technological innovations that we're proud of came about in large part because our software, which I'll talk about here in just a, uh, a second, is old, uh, it is uh, a bit outdated uh, from where, where it was when it started off in 2008. And we were never able to come up with a viable alternative 
for providing this next step in technology. That is for our customers to be able to see where their vehicle was on the day of service, to make trip reservations, to cancel trips, uh, to monitor their trips that they've got in the system that are currently booked trips. They can do all that now. And more importantly, they can do it from an accessible platform. The platform you actually see on the screen is an old screenshot. It doesn't resemble what, we, what our customers would see now. This was an attempt by RouteMatch, our current software provider, to provide the service. Unfortunately, they were unable to provide us with a platform that was uh, able to be used by uh, the blind and sight limited community. The platform we have now did pass uh, WCAG testing. That is the uh, testing platform that is used to determine whether or not uh, uh, a, an app or a web-based service is accessible to screen readers. Uh, and that takes us to where we are right now. And like I said, we're in the process right now of coming up with uh, uh, an RFP that will be put on the street to attempt to replace our legacy software that we've been using since 2008. Uh, obviously, there's nothing wrong with our software. That is to say, it was great in 2008, but I would uh, I, I would suspect that none of us are using the same electric phone, uh, uh, cell phones that we were using in 2008 or computers we were using in 2008. And unfortunately, this technology that was perfectly acceptable at that time simply isn't anymore. Uh, so our hope is, is that by this summer, we will be at a point where we'll be ready to go out to bid and see what else is out there and bring ourselves easily into the 21st century. And then finally, some of the other uh, elements of uh, above and beyond that we're working on, we have a couple of partnerships. One we've already launched with TNCs, uh, that is with Uber. Uh, it's a two-phase process. We're already well into phase one. Uh, we're uh, providing trips under a pilot in the Centennial service area. And uh, it allows people to do the exact same thing they would do if they were booking a trip with excessive cab. That is, they would pay the first two dollars of the trip. The difference there is, uh, unlike excessive cab that tends to only uh, uh, see demand during the off peak, we're trying to find ways that we can shed peak or provide an alternative for folks during the peak periods of the day when we really barely have enough vehicles to meet the demand and provide good quality on time performance. This allows customers to use uh, Uber as an alternative for just $2. And then we provide, because it's during peak periods and we want to incentivize that ability, $20 subsidy is provided by RTD. This is still far less than if we were providing the service ourselves in that uh, during non-COVID times, our average cost or our average subsidy per trip is still in the $55, $56 range per customer. So obviously providing a $20 subsidy for peak travel to use an Uber as an alternative is a good idea for us. It's a good idea for our customers because they then can uh, get an on-demand same day trip that if you've used Uber or Lyft, you well know, can usually be provided within 10 to 15 minutes of the time that you order it up. Phase two of the pilot, which will launch in about a month, will uh, have us using part of our own vehicles to serve uh, passengers that are in wheelchairs so that we can test the uh, uh, the ability of using our fleet along with the Uber Uber vehicles, the ambulatory vehicles, to create a, uh, a whole system that will allow people to have the same experience on same day travel as if they were booking a paratransit trip. Uh, we're expanding our travel training program. That's actually uh, out for, a, we're, we've already received proposals for travel training and are reviewing those right now and hope to have a far more robust uh, program in the near future that will allow people to not only uh, understand better how to use our fixed route system when they can, but go into this knowing fully how to use our paratransit system if they've never used transit before. We obviously find that a lot of our customers when they come to us uh, aren't just needing paratransit services, but it's the first time that they've ever used, para, uh, used transit services in general. So travel training is a big plus to get people off on the right foot. Uh, the trip exchange, which uh, was a pilot that went through the end of last year, uh, helped us learn a lot about some of our peers out there and is something that we hope to be able to see continued in some way or fashion going forward in that we'll 
allow us to further work with partner transit systems and shed our peak and provide alternatives for ways that can, we can provide service. In other words, we don't need to have perhaps 340 vehicles. Perhaps the number is 320, perhaps it's 300. Uh, and then those other trips could be uh, portioned out during peak travel periods to other providers whose peak isn't the same as ours. Uh, and then finally, and along with that, providing first and last mile alternatives means having stronger software. Right now, we don't have the ability to work through an API, which is what the trip exchange was looking to do so that software could talk to one another. That's what we'd like to see going forward. Uh, and that is something that I think can only be achieved from what we've seen by having new software. Once that happens, we'd love to be able to uh, use our uh, rail service for long trips where we could have perhaps, as you can see in the graph or the, uh, the diagram below, accessoride might be the first part of the trip. The longest part in the middle might be, say, for instance, by train or uh, commuter bus. And then the last part might be accessoride on the other side or again, uh, it might be that they could walk or wheel to their destination. But that's just an idea of some of the services that we are doing right now and partnerships that we're working on, pilots that we're working on, uh, and our program uh, in a very abbreviated version. Uh, and at this point, I uh, can take any questions. Great, thank you so much, Paul. Um, I will open it up to members of the committee if you all have any questions for Paul. While you all are thinking, oh, Jackie, go for it. <laughs> no, you know what I was going to suggest? I think I might want to hear, is Paul going to be on till the end? Because I think I want to hear all the presentations and that's probably going to drive a little bit more of what I, my, my thoughts are. Yeah, that makes sense. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Paul. I, I do have one quick question, Paul. In terms of the, the platform or the, the mobile app, does that come in other languages? Or I'm wondering, like, what's the language accessibility? Uh, oh, I see what you're saying. So the uh, the portal or the uh, the app that I was showing, uh, it is only in English right now. Uh, I suspect if we were to add another language and knowing what language we would be expected to add in this area, it would be Spanish. Uh, I'm not sure that we even have that ability right now on our uh, uh, fixed route travel planner. I've, I have never checked into that, but uh, certainly worth noting uh, if it's possible to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one other thing I would note, and I, I wouldn't divert from that, but I've used it myself uh, when I've sat in with some of our reservations agents in the past, and instead of using a language line, have actually pulled up Google on a side screen and used Google as my translating uh, element too. So there's obviously more than one way to tackle any solution. That's obviously another way that we can go about it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we we have a packed agenda and Paul will still be with us. I'm sure additional questions will come up and I want to save some time if folks have um, additional information as they as they hear the other presentations um, for Paul to answer some questions. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Kristen Trustman, uh, a member of the committee who's done um, some analysis of her own on peer agency um, kind of paratransit comparisons. And so, Kristen, I know you have a, a document that you want to share with folks. I will turn it over to you now. I'm not sure that you can see my screen. We can see you a can screen. See it. Okay, good. Uh, what I did was take the peer agencies that uh, North Highlands came up with and I did some research on what their paratransit looked like. Unfortunately, I did this in, instead of in presentation mode, I did it in a uh, Excel spreadsheet, but I can go through each of these lines. The highlighted in yellow are, it's going to be the highest, and am I hearing an echo? Uh, Yes, there is a little bit of an echo. So if folks are not speaking, if you could just unmute your, or mute yourself, that would be great. 
so the what I have highlighted in yellow are going to be the highest uh, whatever fair reservation window, et cetera, of all of these different agencies. So I started out with RTD and they have a, an enormous uh, amount of miles for the service size, over 2,000 miles. Right now their fares are $5 for local, $9 for regional, like a, a trip to Boulder, for example and $20 for the airport. And they take two different kinds of payment methods, cash and the accessoride ticket booklets. They have a, they do not have a seven day reservation window. I apologize. They have a five day reservation window, door to door. Their trip time is comparable to fixed route, which is bus or rail, which is required by the ADA and the subsidy per trip and these numbers I did get from the oh hang on just a second I got from the National Transit Database so what Paul just said as far as the subsidy um, the amount of money it costs RTV that's going to be a little bit different than what we see for the subsidy so right now, the subsidy for RTD is forty-one dollars and forty-two cents. Now, Kristen, and yes. sorry to interrupt. Is there a way that you might be able to zoom in a little bit? It's um, it it is late in the afternoon. It's <laughs> kind of hard for me to see. I can do my best here. There we go. Is that better? Yes. Thank you so much. Okay. Then when you go to Minneapolis St. Paul Metro Mobility, it's very similar to RTD as far as prices. They also have different sets of prices for peak times, which they were not specific about on their website. So it's 450 for peak 350 for off peak and anything over a 15 mile trip. There's a 75 cent surcharge which I'm not really sure what that 75 cents covers. They do offer a different type of electronic payment system. So it's one of those uh, cards that kind of like for when you get on the bus or onto the train, you just flash your card. It does an automatic deduction. All of these, uh, the trip times the trip window as far as how far in advance you can make your trip. They're all very similar except for Harris County, Texas, which lets you make your trips two weeks in advance, which Larry and Paul would say, oh my God, people must forget and cancel all the time. And I know that's exactly what Larry was just thinking. For the Los Angeles County, the LA Metro, you would think that their service area would be larger, but it's not. It, that kind of confused me. Their fare is based on the amount of miles. If it's less than 20 miles, it's 275. Over 20, it's 350. They also accept credit and debit cards, which is interesting. They only have a one day window to make your reservations. They have a curb to curb service, which is basically you've got to meet them where the bus is going to stop, where the shuttle is going to stop. They will not come to the door unless you have some kind of reasonable accommodation. The interesting thing about LA Metro is they have this thing called the COVID Vax program where and that's a typo too the passenger can get on the shuttle the shuttle will take them to a vaccination place they don't have to get out of the vehicle the trip time includes the 15 minute wait time after the first vaccine and then they take you home which i know that rut was interested in possibly using some of the rtd facilities for vaccinations. 
Uh, and this is a really good use of, of what paratransit could possibly do. I don't know the, of course, Things, things can kind of go sideways as far as the logistics, but it's an idea. Uh, Harris County, te Texas, as I said, uh, they'll go 15 days in advance, which is kind of nuts. They only charge you $2 for one half of your trip, which is very affordable. Now they're trip time is interesting they actually say not more than 60 minutes under normal conditions they were not clear about what normal conditions are but they come right out and say you're not going to be on the bus for more than an hour and in my experience that's very reasonable i've been on the bus for more than an hour and it's kind of nightmarish but I thought that was interesting that instead of saying comparable, they just flat out said not more than an hour. Atlanta has a much smaller service area. However, everything else is very comp is very similar to other um, different transit ag transit agencies, except for they are curb to curb only. And they will say comparable to fixed route bus and rail trip times plus 30 minutes. So they're giving themselves quite a bit of leeway as far as how long a person could possibly be on the bus for a trip. Now, the Metro, the Tri-County, which is, uh, and I apologize, this is in the uh, Seattle area. Um, I, I guess I'm used to being sprawled out like in Dallas or in Denver for 383 miles service area. That's, that's pretty small. Uh, they, everything else is very similar to the other transit agencies. Their fare is $2.50, which for those of us who would be using paratransit, we are all usually on some kind of fixed income. And a $5 round trip fare, I believe, is much more affordable than, for example, I'm going to compare it to RTD with their $5 each way. I personally know a lot of folks that can no longer afford to use Accessoride. So they are either pretty much homebound or will use the fixed route transit uh, system. It's, it's tough when you are living on $1,500 a month to be able to afford Accessoride. Now, for the Central Puget, Puget Sound, excuse me, um, they've got a reasonable amount of service area, but they will also do a monthly fare. So if you're on the bus five days a week, for example, that $63 a month is pretty nice way to, to pay for your paratransit. They have the highest subsidy per trip, which is kind of crazy. Um, $83 is a very large subsidy. And then the area that has the largest amount of a service size is the Chicago Urban Paratransit. And Chicago will divide divides things up urban versus suburban. And the interesting thing is if you cross that invisible line between suburban to urban, you have to change the bus. You have to change shuttles, which I thought was really interesting. Uh, again, they are a door-to-door -door service. 
They will only allow you to make reservations one day in advance and their trip time is comparable to fixed route and bus and um, fixed route bus and rail trip times. So I wanted to make things pretty simple as far as these comparisons, but also just give everyone an idea of how other areas in the country, how other metropolitan areas in the country deal with their paratransit. I don't know if, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna check in. Um, Kristen, I did have a question. You mentioned that Chicago has a monthly the monthly fare was that the only one just even looking at this it looks like that may have been the only um location or agency that offers that monthly it's actually monthly. it's actually the the Puget Sound oh, Puget area Sound. which is Washington State uh they were the only ones that had a monthly basically you're all in for the month kind of like a uh, a monthly bus pass they were the only ones that had a monthly rate, a monthly fare. Got it. But everyone else is, it was very similar to each other. Things were off just, you know, by a dollar here or a dollar there or a couple of days. Mm -hmm. But everyone, every metropolitan area's paratransit is very similar to, to Denver's. Mm -hmm. And for members of the committee, just so you all know, this will be sent to you all after after the meeting itself. So I know a lot of us are probably chomping at the bit to look at the numbers a little bit more closely. I do want to check in and see if anyone has any questions before we move on um, to the next um, presentation around human service transit. Uh, you know, I do. Kristen, thanks so much. This was a lot of work um, to give this really great overview. I guess. Um, Wondering if um, there has been a needs assessment uh, done uh, for paratransit by RTD and if we've got the results of that and then you can't answer that. But that's what I was like. I know I'm going to have questions for RTD when I hear more. Um, and then I'm interested also in understanding um, if there's any kind of best management practices uh, surrounding paratransit in the United States and as far as uh, delivery models, um, costs and scheduling and you know, door to door or service, you know, the service. So I, I am, I, I think to really understand this more, that's kind of other additional information I would like to, to be able to see. So, and, but I just want to say a huge thanks, Kristen. My gosh, a lot of good yeah. work here. It was actually a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to see how other people's paratransits work. And I did have to go back and forth because Halfway through, I thought, oh, I need to add this different column or, oh, I need to go back and check on this. But it really was fascinating to me and, and a lot of fun to put together. Yeah, just want to echo um, Jackie's comments. I know that's that was a lot of work and um, thank you so much, Kristen, for sharing out with the team. I, well, I think some of the question, hopefully some of the questions you posed, Jackie, might be answered in the next one. And then Kristen, of course, feel free to jump in. Um, based on your your own learning. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Matthew. So we'll have two presentations from Dr. Cog on um, human service transportation. First, um, Matthew, and then we'll have a brief presentation from Travis. So I will go ahead and turn it over to you, Matthew. And then I'm sure, again, more questions will naturally just pop up as we hear the multiple conversations. So uh, Matthew. Rather than yesterday when it, my computer froze, I'm doing it a little bit differently today. Uh, can you can you see my screen? Um, so we can see your screen, but it is in oh. it's not in presenter mode. One sec. Oh, just taking a second. Okay. PowerPoint just doesn't like us this week. <laughs> hey, Matthew, I'm glad you didn't just do it to me. No. <laughs> <laughs> 
All right. Can everyone still hear me? We can still hear you. Yes. All right. Well, um, oh, here we go. Look at that. No, wait. If you go there. Uh, you can see your screen. <laughs> oh, well, I'm already on the second slide. So let's just, oh, well, oh, OK. Here we go. Oh, all right. Well, um, so <laughs> this project um, that I'm about to talk about was referenced in, in Paul's earlier presentation. I guess I'm, I'm on the second slide now. Well, I don't know what's going on. Uh, <laughs> oh. Um, anyway, so so Ride Alliance is is the trip exchange project that Dr. We can't hear you. I, yep, we can't hear you. Looks like you muted yourself. Are you there? I think he's just trying to make Jackie feel better. <laughs> he's do he's doing it right. I was like, man, I thought Brad was bad. This is. <laughs> I think Dr. Cog might need to invest in some uh, resources for their remote staff. <laughs> <laughs> You're actually moving over to Zoom. We should, we should form the Dr. Cog Accountability Committee. This group would be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, those old 8 bit computers, they just don't cut it anymore. Yeah, I mean, seriously. I, I so, give them a little budget so they can get a new one. Yeah. Can, <laughs> can you hear me now? Showing up at the office. We can. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we can okay. We can hear you, Matthew. Are okay. your ears burning? You're good. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm going to do it like this because presenter yeah. mode seems to not work. So, um, so Paul referenced the uh, the, um, the the Ride Alliance trip exchange uh, in um, in his presentation. This was a project funded by the Federal Transit Administration and CDOT uh, to try and uh, develop uh, an electronic um, interchange. Uh, or, or a trip exchange that that helps RTD and human service transportation providers, which um, you'll hear more about human service transportation from Travis next, um, share trips in order to increase capacity uh, to better meet demand. Um, and, and you can see the, the challenge written there on the screen. So, um, this was funded, like I said, from the Federal Transit Administration. Uh, it's a Veterans Transportation and Community Living Initiative. Uh, it includes a trip exchange, um, a one call, one click, but no wrong door approach, uh, and coordination uh, through Dr. Cog's Area Agency on Aging. Hey, Matt, and, it's not advancing. Oh. Yeah, it looks like it's- We're still on the first slide. Really? I'm on the fourth slide. Well, I could tell by what you were saying, <laughs> but I can't see it on my screen. Oh, lovely. <laughs> this will also be shared afterwards. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Is there a summary slide? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know what I can do to, to change that, but... I'll just I'll go through it verbally with the slides and and we will share it. I, I don't know. This is a brand new computer too, so I don't know if it's that. Can you email it to somebody else who can share it? Well, um, Melinda has a copy, but uh, she had to to go to another meeting, so that doesn't Matthew, help. Matthew, you can you can email it to me. All right. How about that? Uh, just give me one second and I will email it to Ron. Meanwhile, why don't we have Travis's presentation? All right, Travis, are you with us? I, I certainly am and I can I can jump in and right. do my pit before. Heroic, heroic effort. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope everybody can see my screen. We can. I'm going to suggest that you not move it to 
presenter mode. Let's just go with it as it is. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to do that that way. Um, so I'm, I'm Travis Noon. I'm a senior program specialist at Dr. Cog in the admin and finance division. Um, I oversee contracts and compliance for uh, Dr. Cog's area agency on aging, um, which uh, does fund human service transportation. I'm just going to give you a very high level overview of human service transportation in the region, um, and I'm happy to take questions after that. Um, so there really is three sort of major funding streams that flow through Dr. Cog for human service transportation. Um, as the designated area agency on aging, Dr. Cog administers Older Americans Act and Older Coloradans Act funds, which provides funding for services to older adults age 16 and up, uh, and also includes a mandate that we fund transportation for those that population. Uh, in addition, Dr. Cog recently became the designated recipient for uh, Federal Transit Administration Section 5310 funding in the Denver Aurora urbanized area, which provides funds for um, Specialized transit for older adults and individuals with disabilities, uh, similar to the Older Americans Act. Also, as part of the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program at Dr. Cog, Dr. Cog's board set aside $4 million over four years, so $1 million a year, for human services transportation. Um, this funding was federal funding, but we entered into an agreement with CDOT and RTD to essentially swap that federal funding with um, state funding. Uh, which made it very flexible and be able to match the FTA funds and also the Older Americans Act funds. Um, there really was sort of three goals of bringing all of this together and bringing in the 5310 funding under Dr. Cog's umbrella. The biggest one really is to reduce the sort of administrative burden on our human service transportation providers. Um, it allows them to respond to one call for projects, only go through one audit or site review, um, and all that and only report to one organization, uh, which allows them to maximize you know, coordination and maximize the use of available funds. In addition, as I mentioned, with the uh, human service transportation being state funding, we really were able to leverage that and be able to utilize all of the federal funds. You know, the, the 5310 funding in the Denver area was undersubscribed for a long period of time. Um, and it wasn't for a lack of need, but more for a lack of being able to meet the match requirements. Um, and so, you know, being able to have this, this state funding with the, the, the tip set aside allowed us to be able to award funding to meet those match requirements and uh, you know, be able to utilize all of that funding available. So just a little bit about the services that are provided under these funds. Uh, Dr. Cog contracts with nonprofits and local governments to provide these services. Uh, there's a list of the the few of the uh, you know few of them there. Um, you know, Via Mobility Services is obviously the largest in the region. Um, they also took over uh, Seniors Resource Center transportation um, in the Denver region just recently, um, and so they they provide the majority of this service throughout the region. Uh, they these providers do provide door through door demand response transportation, and it serves and they serve older adults individuals with disabilities and other vulnerable populations under the tip set aside that being you know low income veterans uh, other stuff like that um, also under the older americans act funding dr cog does operate a voucher program uh, we utilize uh, transportation network companies so uber and hop skip drive to provide you know, more uh, on-demand type services and in addition we also pay for uh, fares for rtd tickets so we, we we do purchase for older adults that are 16 up, either you know fixed route tickets, or we also do uh, purchase accessor ride tickets to pay those fares. Um, and as sort of this all fits together, and we'll kind of roll into um, Matthew's presentation when he gets that going with the Ride Alliance, you know, sort of through the Ride Alliance program, uh, human service transportation providers and RTD can sort of exchange trips and fundings, uh, and then it gives them the opportunity to maximize efficiency um you know shedding trips to other providers if they're unable to fulfill them or if it's peak demand and the other providers don't have a lot of demand at that time um so that's uh all i got for that um and hopefully that kind of rolls into um matthew's presentation and i'm happy to answer any questions great thank you so much travis i'm gonna just check in um with the committee to see if there's any questions and also, Matthew, just to check in that you are able to share your screen. 
Um, well, I emailed the, uh, can you hear me? Yes. I emailed the presentation to Ron. Uh, he offered to, to show it, so um, should be able to uh, do it. Given the time, I'm going to suggest maybe let's transition straight into Matthew's presentation and then we'll just take questions at the end. And we can see the screen. Here I cannot. Daya, can you see the presentation or the presentation mode? We see the presentation. OK. I still see Travis on there. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what's happening with you, Matthew, but um, tell me which slide you want to advance to and the rest of the. All right. Yeah. yeah, that that sounds like a plan to me. I'll go th from my slides. I was on the. Let's see the fourth slide. I was saying that the coordinated transportation activities um uh are uh the older americans act the 5310 and the hst which uh travis just outlined so i will move on to the next slide slide five okay and um so uh one of the steps in the process was to procure vendors and consultants and we worked with route match uh for the core technology for this project and a, a company called Demand Trans Solutions uh, to, uh, for the uh, Trip Exchange platform. They also helped us with enhancements to the Trip Exchange, um, uh, a, uh, a data adapter connector, and they provide hosting and maintenance, uh, which is ongoing. Then we also received some great help uh, in consulting services uh, from a firm called Transit Plus. Uh, they helped us with business rules, which were incredibly important uh, uh, because just because you have technology in the background uh, helping you facilitate this trip exchange doesn't mean that you don't uh, need to have uh, rules uh, that um, each of the participating agencies agree to, uh, to 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 make it run smoothly. Uh, you know, everything from what to call certain things so that uh, the words are uniform to um, you know how much funding could be exchanged uh, um, wh uh, when does uh, um, transportation agent a uh, agency a give up the the trip when when is their responsibility end and the net and the and the um, next transportation agency uh, responsibility for the trip begin uh, so that was incredibly important um, also, uh, stakeholder facilitation, and they helped with uh, with uh, pilot imp implementation. Uh, slide six. Um, so uh, the the stakeholders were very diverse for this uh, project. Uh, we had uh, transportation providers, obviously, um, veterans organizations, uh, human service uh, organizations, and uh, certainly uh, many of the municipal jurisdictions participated as well. Uh, next slide. So project milestones. Um, as I said, we procured the software. Uh, we had the the enhancements uh, for the um, for the trip exchange. There were uh, these were items that were identified by the stakeholders as ways to improve what was already existing. Um, things that that helped uh, the facilitation of. Um, uh, the the exchange of of um, funding and um, uh, being able to pull from different pots of funding uh, certainly helped. Uh, we rebranded. Uh, you saw the logo on the first slide, or maybe you didn't. No, you did see the first slide. Uh, uh, we worked with our marketing department for that. Um, created the business rules, as I said. Um, then we also uh, secured funding to test the system. Um, and then uh, we had uh, the data connection module, uh, HIPAA and privacy standards, another part of the business rules uh, uh, to make sure that um, everyone was complying with, uh, with privacy standards and, and HIPAA uh, that, uh, uh, and making sure that um, you know, a liability uh, was um, the, uh, not undue on any of the participants. Um, that took a long time as well. Uh, we did some marketing, um, marketing materials. Um, we 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 set up portals, and and you can see uh, the the rest there. Um, 
the, uh, there was quite a bit of legwork uh, to, to get this project going. Uh, next slide. And so uh, goals of the pilot were to test the software system, test and refine the coordination protocols, uh, which included the business rules and payment processes, and uh, um, certainly learn all of the lessons uh, through you know, a much smaller uh, 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 implementation in the beginning through a pilot. Uh, this is, uh, next slide, sorry. Um, this is a diagram of how it essentially works. So you see all the different transportation providers, you see um, how uh, the, the, the trip exchange or the hub was in the, the center of it all. Uh, there were two different portals. Uh, one, some of the transportation providers used uh, that, that couldn't connect directly. The other was more of a facility portal um, that was used by uh, the Denver Regional uh, Mobility and Access Council because they were also steering um, uh, trips into the exchange th uh, through uh, their, their call center or they are, uh, but also um, senior uh, assisted living facilities, nursing homes, uh, uh, places like that are also able to use that facility portal to um, request trips for their clients. Uh, next slide. And so the future uh, it, uh, will, will look to um, expand with more uh, transportation agencies um, and, and um, uh, create a more flexible MOU. The one we currently have is is is, is a little bit tough to work under, but um, it, it, we, we needed to have the pilot first to, to, to really figure out uh, what we're doing and um, also developing a, a more comprehensive uh, coordination manual. Uh, so uh, with that, um, I think we can uh, take uh, any questions. Is there any time left? Yep. Great, thank, thank you, Matthew. Um, we have a little bit of time left, and so I do want to open it up to the committee if there's any questions. I see Brett, go for it. You're on mute, Brett. There we go. I think that's you. Matthew, from the, from the very beginning of this till you're actually delivering services, how long was that process? How long did it take to get there? Well, um, the, the original grant came out back in 2011. Um, the, the, the project, uh, there was some planning that went on. It was a different agency that, that housed the project. Um, it, it's a very complicated project and it, it took it took a lot of work at Dr. Cog once we received it. But in uh, in the interim between when the, the, the grant originally came out and um, when Dr. Cog received it, there was another project um, uh, that um, helped develop the prototype for the trip exchange. And the sponsor of that project was Via Mobility. And they worked with stakeholders in the northwestern part of the Denver region uh, and uh, Demand Trans and um, Route Match to develop the prototype for the um, for the trip exchange. Then when Dr. Cog got it, we went through. Uh, um, I'm sorry. There's a little bit of feedback. I think if folks can put themselves on mute. Uh, so uh, Dr. Cog didn't get the grant until I think it was like 2017, uh, and so we we um, we, we took it uh, to the to the finish line to the um, to to the pilot and, and beyond. Uh, we had to do a lot of legwork, um, as I as I talked about. Um, you know the the work with the stakeholders, developing the business rules. Um, you know. Uh, uh, making sure that that uh, the trip exchange works for everybody. Uh, it, it took a lot of monthly and 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 weekly meetings with the stakeholders and and the participants. And it took it took a few years to really get it running. And what year were you actually delivering services? Uh, the the pilot began late last year. Okay. Thank you. I I just and want to be it, clear on the. This is Ron Data. Yeah. Sorry, no, if I can, it's it's not that we're providing services, Rut. Oh, this is yes. this is this is a platform where the people that the the service providers 
get hooked up with requests for rides. So we're basically facilitating the connection between those that are requesting rides to the service providers that provide them. Dr. Cog's not actually providing the rides. We fund and pay for trips. Understood. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that, Ron. Uh, Jackie. Do you know the what's the cost per ride? That's a good question. Um, it's it's not it's not the same exactly for um, each of the transportation agencies. I know part of the business rules that were developed, uh, they were uh, going to try and find some um, uh, some compromised um, uniform amounts. Uh, as far as I know, we haven't gotten to to that yet. But typically, human service transportation um, costs less than accessoride. Um, I don't know what the typical average cost is right now. Uh, Travis would probably better be uh, better be better be better able to answer that question, uh, but I, it's typically less than than paratransit. Yeah. And Ron, I saw that you had your hand raised. I don't know if you had something you wanted to add. I was gonna I was gonna wait for Travis to answer. Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm happy to to address that. But. Um, the human service transportation providers, it is less than accessor ride. So um, right now it is it is much higher just because considering their um, um, their demand is down. So they're they have fixed costs that um, that stayed the same regardless of how many trips they're providing. But we we are typically sort of in the the high 30s right now. We're closer to 50 um, is what we're paying these providers. And I, I was just going to add Dea and to the group and Travis, correct me if I'm wrong, but the the cost varies quite a bit depending on the type of trip and who the service provider is. It's not and and sort of what the funding program is. So the different there a lot of these trips are funded by different programs. So it could be could be Medicaid, could be veterans um, services, could be um, through our area agency on aging and the and they can have different sort of funding and reimbursement rules and and rates depending on sort of who's requesting the trip and who's providing the trip. Correct. Yeah. And 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 all you know the the service area of the provider definitely drives sort of that uh, that cost, right? So somebody like the city and county of Broomfield who's only operating in Broomfield, you know, their costs are much lower because they're not traveling very far. So um, it, it does vary pretty widely between all of the providers. Has the quality of service been assessed from the clients with any kind of a survey tool? Ron or Travis, are you, Matthew? Are you, a, are you asking just in relation to Ride Alliance? That's a good question. I would say both, and I apologize, I'm still trying to distinguish between the pro the Ride Alliance program Matthew was talking about and the program you're talking about, Travis. So I guess what I'd like to understand is both, if there are, it sounds like there's overlap, but there's some also different, the human service transport programs, is that different than Ride Alliance? I mean, and don't bother explaining that. Just tell me what, tell me if people like it and it's working for them. Sure. Uh, so so I, I can explain it a little bit in the sense that you know, Ride Alliance is connecting the human service transportation providers and RTD to exchange trips. That's the the high level overview of Ride Alliance. Um, I don't think there's been a survey in general over Ride Alliance or people who have taken trips that have gone through that exchange. Um, when it comes to human service transportation providers, all of our transportation providers that we contract with are required to do consumer satisfaction surveys as part of the funding that they get. Um, and, and as far as I know, all of that's come back is very positive feedback. I guess I had a similar question and then I'll um, uh, turn over to you. Uh, one question that I had is around the utilization and what does that look like? I guess it gets back to Jackie's question. Like, I'm just thinking through like repeat users that might indicate that they like the, the service itself. I don't know if you all have any sense of what that might look like. Um, I'll say a lot of our the human service transportation providers they provide um, get like subscription trips is what they call them in the sense that they're providing uh, you know weekly trips to dialysis weekly trips to chemotherapy all that sort of stuff so and that's the vast majority of the trips they provide are those trips so they are repeat users on a regular basis um, and I and I will say that you know 
in general, you know, most people that use the service are going to use the services again. Right. Um, Brett, you had a question. Uh, yeah, this is probably for Paul. Paul, how many? Uh, what What is your average number of passengers on uh, on an accessoride trip? A average number of passengers. Per trip? At average number of people that are getting services on an accessory trip and they may have companions or something that, that are with them. I don't know. I'm not counting those. I'm just talking about people that are getting a, a service. Our, our, uh, or in need of accessory. Yeah, our passengers per revenue hour right now it is 1.2 passengers per revenue hour. Uh, that's low, both as a result of what uh, Kristen Trustman had already indicated, which is we have one of the largest service areas in the nation. As a result, we have one of the largest trip lengths on average for the service we provide. But it also has to do with uh, our software not really uh, having the chops to be able to provide us uh, a more efficient service scheduling. But that's what we do right now is about 1.2 per hour. Right. And uh, on a on a typical, how many people per vehicle when you're delivering services? Uh, it won't be much more than that. Uh, now, uh, it, it varies by time of day. So during those yeah. peak travel periods I was talking about earlier, during non-COVID periods, we can easily see five, six, seven people on a vehicle, especially if they're going to a larger facility like Shalom or Lairdon. But most of the time, especially during off peak, you're going right. to see something clo more closely approaching that number I just gave you. Right. Thanks. So I, I want to acknowledge that we are over time and we've also experienced some technical difficulties during this call. Um, I, I just want to check in to see if there may be one additional question that we weren't able to get to before we wind down the meeting. Um, so for members of the committee, if there's someone that hasn't had a, a question asked, but has a burning question that you all would like to get answered, I do want to just give that opportunity. And I will be looking for hands raised. So at the very top of your screen, you'll see a little smiley face with a hand. That is how you raise your hand. And if I do not see one, we will wrap up this meeting. <laughs> OK, I am not seeing any. What I do want to offer again is that since there were so many technical difficulties, a couple of things that you all will be receiving post meeting are the presentations as well as the Excel spreadsheet that Kristen shared um, with us. Um, if folks do have questions, once you have an opportunity to not only digest this information, but digest the information on your own, please do feel free to direct those uh, questions over to um, the Dr. Cog team and we'll be able to get those respond uh, responses. Um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and close down the meeting. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for bearing with the technical difficulties and we will see you at our next meeting. Thank you.